Um, so our last talk is uh, by Jamie Quinn on four pillars of a reproducible PhD. Uh, this is again a pre-recorded lightning talk, so I'll um, share that with you now. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie, a research software engineer from UCL, and I've just recently finished my PhD from the University of Glasgow in solar astrophysics. Um, and I want to share some of the experiences I had trying to produce a reproducible PhD thesis. And most of you are not the target of this particular blog post. Um, it's mainly written for students or academics who are struggling to make sense of the vast landscape of reproducibility, best practices and tools. I remember going to a a great talk by the Software Sustainability Institute, which totally changed the way I, I think about research. But I also remember sitting in front of just this wall of logos um, representing different tools that I could use to improve the reproducibility of my research. And I left just not understanding how to apply it all to, to my own research. Um, so I want this blog post to, to really just be a case study of a few good practices and tools that really improve the reproducibility of my research in practice. For context, my PhD involved lots of large, long-running simulations, producing a lot of data, um, which was processed in sometimes quite complex analysis pipelines. Um, so the tools I chose and the good practices I, I really engaged with are not necessarily applicable to all research and all PhDs. Um, but I think the, the, the fundamental core tenets of, of uh, a reproducible PhD um, is pretty general. Um, the four elements that I actually identified were version control, automation, open publication, and sustainable software. Now, I'm sure I don't have to extol the virtues of version control to anyone here, um, but in this section, I, I give examples of how I used Git, GitHub, Git LFS, the large file storage extension of Git, um, Zenodo, and also how I wrangled um, Jupyter Notebooks into, into uh, behaving well in Git repositories. Um, automation was key to ensuring that I was running uh, correct simulations at any one time. Uh, the parameters of simulations were actually hard-coded in the source, so it was easy to forget to change value or forget to re recompile or something. Um, so having a set of, of simple but relatively robust tools to help automate much of the ro running of simulations um, was really essential to my work, um, along with um, actually guiding a lot of the complex uh, data pipelines that I spoke about. Um, in the post, I suggest learning Bash, just to write simple um, automation scripts. That's how I wrote all of mine. Uh, along with learning Make for the more complex pipelines that have multiple dependencies. Um, and I really enjoyed Make because it allowed um, you to run uh, pipelines in parallel using just this simple minus J flag. Um, I also touch on using uh, rsync for, for transferring files. So the third pillar I identified was um, open publication, um, both in terms of uh, open publication of papers through open access or through preprint uh, servers, as well as open publishing of code, not just on GitHub, but more formally uh, producing DOIs with Zenodo, which was what I chose. I also talk about uh, licensing a little bit. Um, the last pillar, um, and probably the largest in terms of good practices um, is sustainable software. Now, obviously, version control and automation kind of come into uh, sustainability, uh, as well as publishing. Um, but I really kind of just wanted to focus on a, a few good habits that, that um, readers could, could take away um, from this. Habits like documenting code and regular refactoring. And I, I, did, I do mention testing, but I realise that testing is probably not super important to perhaps students who are just writing a lot of analysis in, in Python or something. You know, I, I don't know how robust that, that kind of software has to, has to be. Um, so in short, I wrote this post to distill the vast number of good practices and tools down into a digestible case study. Um, if, if you 
think I could have improved the reproducibility of my thesis um, in any other way, I'd love to hear about it. If you have thoughts on how we as a community of RSEs can produce more simplified or focus, focused resources, um, let me know. I realise the Turing way also does present reproducibility in a really nice, simple way, uh, but I would love to see more case studies like this of particular tools and practices being used in particular fields. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jamie. I'll give you a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Hope someone else is around too. Um, do we have any questions for Jamie? Yeah, I have I have one. Please go ahead. Um, what would you say about the the format of, of documentation? Like, you know, traditionally people might just write a giant Word doc or you know a PDF or something. But you know, I find you know, like most software nowadays comes with you know big nice GitHub pages, documentation websites that um, I think are a little bit more easy to digest. And so uh, yeah, I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on that, I guess, versus the, maybe the more traditional ways of documenting software. Yeah, I I think that the, the kind of target audience for, for this blog post were, were um, students or, or academics who, who weren't really writing, uh, let's say, production codes, so maybe not simulation software um, or or kind of tools that, that the other folk might need. So the, the kind of the documentation that I, I was mainly thinking of, you know, have you described your functions well and written comments, you know, that kind of level. Um, but to be honest, yeah, I, I think I, I would encourage um, students who are writing maybe uh, tools that are that are intended to be used by other people. Um, I would encourage, you know, trying to build in something like Sphinx for, for, for Python um, or, or even like Doxygen, you know, uh, and I know it's, it's, it's fairly easy to, to integrate th these things with like read the docs and, and that kind of thing through GitHub Actions, you know, uh, some of the cook cookie cutter templates for, for Python packages, I think, um, provide nice examples of how easy it is to set up automated um, pipelines of, you know, you just write the, the documentation and the code itself and then suddenly it turns into a read the docs um, thing. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Uh, for Jamie or for... Oh. Uh, I, just, I just want to ask another. So, like, uh, what do you think? Like, is it a good idea to, like, uh, also add where your software failed actually to produce the uh, results? So, in your, in your, like, no, it, it might not be a documentation, but some bit of like information where you say that this, these are the areas where I failed and like, uh, what do you think about that? Uh, is it a good idea? Um, yeah, I, I would, I would personally love to see more of that in academic papers, particularly describing code. Um, I think, I can't remember if the Journal of Open Source Software does anything along those lines of, you know, trying to describe a uh, pitfalls with the with the software um so yeah to answer your question personally yeah i would love to see it i'd love to see more of you know what, what went wrong when developing the software what can others learn from my failures um but i haven't actually seen many folk doing that i mean maybe it's because it takes too much time to reflect on it and then write that up i, I don't know I wonder if um, GitHub issues could be useful in that sense, because you know, people, if you sort of log things as you go, if you find problems with your own software, and then you can see possibly the, the process that you've gone through yourself as, as you've sort of fixed it. Uh, I wonder if that would help. Yeah, that's a nice idea. 